I'm going to introduce Jared Schaefer. Jared is with the Ohio Department of Agriculture. He works with the um, OSCAR, the Ohio Sensitive Crop Registry, and he'll be um, talking about some new things since we're now working with Field Watch with, the, with OSCAR. Again, my name is Jared Schaefer. I'm an inspector with the Department of Agriculture in the Plant Health Division dealing with pesticides and uh, fertilizer uh, programs. Um, for the past four years or so, I've been managing a specialty crop registry that we've had for the state of Ohio and uh, doing outreach for this program, uh, speaking with beekeepers across the state, specialty crop producers and uh, pesticide applicators uh, such as yourselves. And uh, recently, we've made uh, uh, some pretty big changes to the registry. If you are familiar with the system we had in place uh, previously, we've recently changed this program. So uh, this talk is going to be a little bit different uh, compared to presentations I've given uh, in the past. Uh, so what is this registry program? Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, this is essentially a, a tool that we provide for beekeepers and farmers and other pesticide applicators uh, in Ohio to use uh, specialty crop producers and beekeepers, both commercial beekeepers and hobbyist beekeepers, uh, can go to this website uh, that I'll be showing you and they can highlight their locations on this map, provide uh, their contact information uh, for these sites so that applicators, not just ag applicators, but uh, any other you know, industrial vegetation or aerial applicators, uh, mosquito abatement you know, companies, uh, can search these locations and see where these sensitive locations are in relation to their target areas that they, that they plan to treat. Um, the system is completely voluntary to use, uh, you know, we're, the Department of Agriculture and we're kind of maintaining the system, but there's no uh, enforcement rules uh, behind it. It's completely voluntary for, for everybody to use. Uh, you know, a lot of folks, some beekeepers in particular, have uh, privacy concerns. They may not be interested in having their locations uh, mapped online for people to look at. Uh, you know, that's okay. Uh, you know, they're, they're not gonna be on the map. <laughs> You know, if that's their concern, but uh, for everybody else who, you know, can see a, a benefit to using the system, you know, it's available for them to use. Um, and again, it's important to note that this is not a regulatory, uh, you know, legal enforcement type of tool. You know, we at the department are not really using this to enforce any rules. Uh, we just kind of keep it running and it's for people out in Ohio, uh, farmers, uh, and applicators to use. Um, there's no special legal protections associated with using this program. It's a communications tool. So people who sign up for it, uh, you know, some people are under the impression that this is a do not spray list. Uh, that's not really the case. Uh, you know, you're still allowed to spray your property even if somebody is, is on this system. Uh, so it doesn't afford them any additional protections other than what's already in the law. Um, and it doesn't reduce, you know, potential liability on the applicator side. Uh, just because you look at the system and it looks okay, there's no sites, uh, doesn't mean that you, you, you still have all of their responsibilities, um, you know, when, when you make your applications. Uh, so that being said, you know, why, why, why do we have this registry program? It's not, uh, you know, giving any special protections. Uh, well, this is a, a communications tool, as I mentioned. And for the past few years, uh, you know, several years, in fact, there's been quite a lot of concern from specialty crop producers, um, grape growers and tomato growers in particular, about uh, you know the new 24D and dicamba and dual products and things that are uh, were at the time you know on the horizon, um, moving away from glyphosate to 24D becoming more common, um, you know the changing of the timing of the application, you know some of the timing can change so that these things can be applied when tomatoes and fruits are blooming 
when they're more vulnerable to these types of applications. Uh, it was a pretty big concern for them. Uh, and just the regular sensitivity of fruits and vegetables to 2,4-D and dicamba uh, and the potential volatility of these products. You know, historically they've been uh, fairly volatile. There's no formulas should help with that. Uh, but that, you know, there's still a lot of concern. There's a lot of reason to uh, be concerned about unintentional damage uh, from the use of these products. And so it was thought that having a tool like this, a communications tool, uh, where applicators can easily find out where these high value, high risk locations are um, and get contact information, uh, that this would help reduce uh, some of those concerns that would help reduce the risk of that unintentional uh, pesticide damage. And, you know, it would calm people down or let people know that applicators are being responsible, that they're doing everything they can. You know, it's kind of a, a become a bit more uh, acceptable uh, to use these products. Um, and if we have fewer cases of damage of pesticide misuse, then you know vineyards can grow their grapes without fear of losing their business and soybean producers can use these technologies you know the products that they really need to to manage some of these uh, you know resistant weeds that, that are cropping up so this is a stewardship tool uh, to help people you know be aware of what's going on help reduce some of that risk and allow operators both uh, you know commodity grain uh, producers and specialty crop producers to to operate and use the the pesticides and, and you know technologies that that they need to use uh, so talking a little bit more about uh, risk there's been some research that uh, Cindy has done um, some other folks uh, that suggests that a lot of the pesticide damage that occurs in Ohio uh, does not get reported to the Department of Agriculture, uh, who you know we investigate these damage complaints when they come in. Um, you know that a lot of damage is just kind of accepted uh, as you know standard, uh, you know cost of business, and you know maybe uh, you know you drift on your neighbor, damage a few rows of beans and maybe he'll drift on you next year. You know, it's all kind of comes out in the wash and it's not too big of a deal, you know. Uh, but we've been hearing, at least I've been hearing from some people uh, that, uh, you know, that might not be the case anymore for particular areas. You know, there's a lot more anger out there between neighbors. Uh, you know, there's a lot more damage uh, that can be done whether you're growing a specialty crop or not. Um, and, you know, that might continue with the spread of these, you know, new dicamba and 2,4-D uh, products. And I think that it's important for uh, producers and applicators to realize how expensive uh, some of these operations can be. Uh, these are some numbers that uh, Cindy put together uh, using, I believe it was, uh, some averages from 2016 uh, USDA data average yields average prices uh, here in Ohio uh, so you can see that you know tomato and grapes for example are pretty high value uh, crops in a very small area you know five to ten times more than what it would cost uh, for a soybean operation for example and you know, grain farmers are kind of familiar with the cost of operating and harvesting grain, but they may not be familiar with uh, specialty crop operations. And, you know, it's a pretty significant difference um, in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of money that they're putting in and, and expect to, to get out of these operations. Grapes in particular, because they are perennial, you know, they're not uh, planted annually like uh, corn and beans. Uh, and they can take three, four, maybe five years after planting to really start to produce uh, grapes. Depends on the variety and uh, other issues, but it can be multiple years. And if their vines are killed or damaged by uh, pesticide, 
uh, you know, for, for soybeans or, or corn, it could knock them out of, uh, you know, business for several years. And that's potentially, you know, a very expensive replacement cost, you know, that the applicator could be liable for, you know, that's all done through civil lawsuits. So it's, you know, uh, up to the, the case, how much the damages are actually worth, but, uh, you know, the potential is pretty high. Uh, there's a lot of financial risk involved, uh, both for the applicator and for the producer who's growing these crops. Um, so apart from the uh, financial risks, which again are mostly, you know, damage compensations done through lawsuits, um, we do issue fines every once in a while, but uh, most of the financial risk probably comes from those lawsuits uh, settled between the two parties. Um, apart from that, there are some uh, legal obligations that the crop registry mapping system that I'm going to talk about and uh, show to you in a minute uh, that the registry can help with, help reduce the risk of um, and allow people to help uh, vi or not violate the law, but to, to follow the law. Uh, so for example, we have a regulation here in Ohio um, about beekeeper uh, notifications. Uh, it's a pretty specific rule you have to be using a pesticide that's labeled as being toxic to bees and it has to be a crop and it has to be in flower at the time of application and it has to be within a half mile of an apiary and the apiary needs to be registered with ODA. So that rules out a lot of people, but there are some applicators who are operating under these conditions. And for those people, they are legally obligated to notify the beekeeper a day in advance before the application. Um, in this registry program, it's a map. It's not just a list of addresses, which is really useful for people who do need to notify beekeepers or people who just want to notify beekeepers. Maybe they're not required to do it, but they want to do it voluntarily. And that's great. Um, but previously, uh, an applicator would have to contact our office, our apiary program at the Department of Agriculture, and request the list of apiaries, and we would send them a list of addresses or a list of directions uh, to these apiaries for a county or several counties that they're operating in. Then the applicator would have to figure out where these addresses are, where they are in relation to their target treatment area, and figure out if they're within a half mile, you know, and you know get the contact information for those folks. Uh, so it's a pretty involved process. And having this mapping system where, you know, you can easily see they're already mapped. You don't have to sort out the addresses and you can easily, easily tell where they are in relation to your, uh, to your target area. Uh, it really helps uh, with following this, this law in particular. Um, and I did, I've been talking a lot about um, agricultural pesticides, but the mapping program is really good for really any type of pesticide application. Uh, there are a lot of urban beekeepers uh, who are able to use the mapping program. A lot of urban beekeepers hide their hives. Uh, they don't want their neighbors to know about them or they're concerned about vandalism or some other problem. Uh, so uh, lawn care companies, you know, turf applicators, um, you know, utility companies doing industrial vegetation uh, applications, um, really any type of, of pesticide applicator uh, can use uh, this mapping program to see where beehives are, where uh, sensitive locations are, not just um, agricultural applicators. And another uh, legal obligation for people who are using these products, um, some product labels, um, which is uh, legally enforceable. You're legally required to follow all the label instructions on the products that you use. Uh, a lot of them have instructions on them about dealing with uh, drift, drift management, um, dealing with crops that are susceptible or sensitive or specialty crops. This is part of the Extend Max label, uh, which requires applicators to survey the treatment area before making the application. Uh, so 
you can see the label says uh, the susceptible crops include non-tolerant soybean strains varieties, um, not just you know fruits and, and vegetables that you'd normally think of as uh, susceptible crops. And there's a big list down at the bottom about other things that are considered susceptible, tomatoes, fruiting vegetables, trees, grapes, beans, flowers, etc. And so as part of the requirements for using these products, you need to survey the area before making uh, the application and not to spray in that direction. Uh, you know, if the wind's blowing, it varies a little bit from product to product, but a lot of them have language similar to this. And since these are, you know, have the uh, legal enforcements, you have to follow these. Uh, it can be a burden for some people who are uh, commercial applicators or aerial applicators who are uh, spraying areas that they may not be familiar with. You know, if you're uh, spraying your field, you've been working in your field, and then you know what your neighbors are growing for years, uh, it may not be too big of a deal, but if you have an applicator business, you're moving around spraying different areas, um, you know, it's a lot of work to figure out where these susceptible locations are. Vineyards in particular can pop up pretty quick. Uh, there's a lot of new hops uh, uh, production going on in Ohio right now. Uh, so a lot of hops and vineyards. Uh, tomatoes are being planted right now and rotated in. Uh, so there's a lot of tomato fields popping up about this time. Um, so another thing to note about this is we have this requirement to survey the area for these sensitive locations before using uh, these products. And it's important to note that because the registry program is voluntary, uh, it's not going to be a complete list. You know, every susceptible crop in Ohio is not going to be on this map. So it's not a complete substitution for doing this uh, field scouting uh, work that needs to be done prior to application. You know, you still need to survey the area. Um, but it is useful in the sense that the people who are signing up for the mapping program, you know, you know that they're on the list because they uh, care very much about the crop that they're growing, right? So these are uh, areas that the farmer is very concerned about drift damage. And you know that if they're on the map, and they do have damage, you know that these are the guys who are going to be complaining about it, All right? So you can kind of target uh, certain people, you know, maybe be a little bit more careful around these areas uh, because they are definitely concerned and are keeping an eye on, on what's going on. Uh, so the, again, the goal of the program is to reduce the risk of pesticide damage, both for the crop producer who could be damaged and the applicator who's doing the application and could be liable uh, for those damages. Uh, so, you know, pesticide damage, the potential uh, costs associated with that damage, uh, legal costs and consequences, uh, public perception, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, consequences to using uh, these products incorrectly and, you know, having all this unintentional damage. And part of this risk reduction comes from the training and education requirements uh, that we have in Ohio and are, you know, some level uh, at the federal level. Uh, if anybody has sat through the Dicamba uh, training classes that are required to use those products, uh, you know that there are a lot of restrictions and a lot of instructions on how to use those products correctly. It's a lot more complicated than uh, the Roundup that people are familiar with. Um, there's a lot of education involved. And another part of the risk reduction, apart from the training requirement, is awareness. Awareness of the weather conditions. Uh, that Aaron spoke of, and also awareness of knowing uh, where these sensitive, high value, high risk locations are uh, in relation to your treatment area. Um, and so taking uh, that awareness component, finding out where these high risk areas are is where the crop registry kind of comes in and helps fill in uh, that gap of information. 
So I mentioned at the beginning of the program, or my presentation rather, that um, we've just made a major change to our crop registry. If you're familiar with it, uh, we started our version in the spring of 2014. Uh, this was a program that was developed by us at the Department of Agriculture, and we maintained it, ran it for several years, uh, built up a pretty large user base. We had almost 2,000 people uh, using the program. Uh, when we made the switch this past March to a registry program maintained and operated by Driftwatch, or Fieldwatch rather. Uh, there's a lot of names, it can get a little confusing. Uh, so you may be familiar with the program, it's called Driftwatch. Um, we just switched to this program, you know, version two, there's a lot of, uh, it's a lot more user friendly, there's a lot of improvements and compatibility uh, with this new program that I'll, I'll speak to in a minute. Uh, so you may be familiar with the name Driftwatch. Uh, Driftwatch was a program created by Purdue back around 2008. Um, and that was at a time when there's, you know, a lot of people were talking about these dual products uh, moving away from Roundup and to some of these new technologies. And so there was a lot of interest in surrounding states around Indiana to use the Driftwatch program to help mitigate some of that risk. Um, and because of all that interest from outside states, they decided to uh, start a company. I'm not sure who started it exactly, but it's a nonprofit company called Fieldwatch. And they kind of transferred ownership of the program to Fieldwatch. So Fieldwatch is a company that manages, develops, and operates this Driftwatch program. Um, and part of what they do is they continue to develop it and get it adopted by other states. Um, and so we have this drift watch program and then kind of a separate program called bee check, which is for beekeepers to add their, their hive locations uh, to this bee check registry. Crop producers add their crops to the drift watch registry and it all ends up on a single map that applicators can look at and see everything. Uh, so it's a little bit more separated out than what we've had in Ohio in the past. Um, but it's, it's still pretty uh, streamlined and, and user-friendly. Once you get working with it, it's not too complicated to, to use. The bee check system is pretty similar to, to Drift Watch. It's a little bit simpler uh, for beekeepers. They basically just click on the map and it gives you a point of where the hives are rather than having to draw uh, field areas and go through menu selections. Uh, so since the company was formed in 2012, they've obviously spread out uh, quite a lot across the country. We've got about 19 other states, or 19 states including Ohio, uh, are currently using the program, uh, plus uh, province in, in Canada is using it. And uh, having all these states on board and you know having Ohio on board is, is, is good because we have this kind of brand uh, recognition uh, you don't know, have every state using a different product. Uh, it's kind of Driftwatch. Everybody uh, knows Driftwatch after a while, and people who operate in multiple states can use the same program. Uh, they all have access to it. Uh, so it helps get more users on board, um, much larger user base. And that's really critical because the more people are using it, you know, the more useful it is. Producers and beekeepers need a lot of applicators to use the map. You know, if nobody's looking at it, then you know it's not very useful. And the flip side is applicators need a lot of producers and beekeepers using it because if there's nothing to look at, then it's not useful for applicators. So it's kind of a cyclical thing. And having all these states, all these there's uh, retailers and ag businesses, uh, manufacturers are kind of sponsoring the program and behind the program to help spread word. Uh, about it and get enrollment up and just makes it a much more uh, useful product than, than what we can do on our own. Um, and Fieldwatch has been doing a good job. They have their own outreach team uh, who goes around to, to retailers, um, John Deere, and, and doing co-ops, Heritage Co-op, for example, I believe just uh, signed on as a member uh, with, with Fieldwatch. And you know, so they have their own uh, recruitment 
memes out there to, to make it more useful and get more, get more people using it. Um, a lot of the funding uh, for the program comes from the member states um, and from larger business sponsors, and this allows them to continue developing it. Um, previously, with our system, you know, we were uh, you know, paying for the development and the operation of the system here in Ohio. And for FieldWatch, it's a similar situation where states pay to be uh, using the system. So the Ohio Department of Agriculture pays uh, FieldWatch to become a member. And now that we're a member, um, crop producers and beekeepers in Ohio can add their locations to the Ohio map uh, for free. You know, it's free for them to use. Um, and applicators can search the maps in Ohio for free. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's, there's no charge for that. It's kind of the larger businesses and, and states who are sponsoring and, and providing funding for this project. Um, and in fact, you can lurk, look for uh, locations in any other member state. So if you have uh, places in Michigan or in Indiana that you spray, as well as in Ohio, you can see those, you sign up and go online, and you can see the locations in those other states, um, as well as the states in Ohio. You don't need to you know, sign up and use a different program for each state that you may be working in which is one of the big benefits of Ohio switching to, to this program. Um, and what I do here in Ohio, again, uh, we pay to be a member and then my role is kind of as a data steward. Um, I kind of manage the program here for Ohio and do a little bit of quality control on the data that's being submitted into the program. And I do some outreach uh, speaking to pesticide schools uh, you know, uh, producer associations and bee clubs uh, to help uh, raise awareness about it at, you know, kind of a local level. Um, and again, we do quality control to make sure that the mapped information going into the system is, is useful and relevant. We're not getting a bunch of uh, junk uh, uh, data in there. And it's, you know, good. They're just a list of sponsors. Uh, some of these slides are coming from uh, field watch, but this is a list of some of their sponsors. So is, you know, the point is that, you know, there's a lot of folks behind it. A lot of big companies are behind this. It's not just some little thing that's gonna, you know, dry up and go away after a couple of years. They're continually, uh, you know, expanding and improving on this program. And, and we're going to have it here in Ohio, you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty stable, um, program that we're going to continue to to use. The way that the the program works for FieldWatch is, you know, a major priority for them is maintaining a, a balance of people who are directing the program. So there are a lot of states involved. There are a lot of individual people involved. Uh, you know, users from every state. Maybe they want something a little bit different from the program. And so the way to kind of keep everything focused and, and useful for everybody is that they have a, a board of directors. This is a nonprofit again. So they have a board of directors made up of people from different, uh, different parts of the industry. They have producers, uh, folks from Red Gold, for example, are on the board, um, applicator companies, like CPS, manufacturers are there, uh, Monsanto, Dow, BA. SF, you know, the big uh, manufacturer companies, and then there are some governmental groups. Uh, Purdue has a seat on the board. And so it's kind of a diverse um, group of people so that it kind of helps, you know, balance to make sure that producers are being represented, that it's a useful tool, things are being developed that producers can use, that it's useful for applicators, um, and that we don't kind of, you know, uh, that it doesn't go off in a direction that, that people don't want it to go in. And one of the things that the board of directors outlines and that I enforce here in Ohio um, is the scope of the program. Um, the registry program, the mapping program is really only intended for commercial agricultural produ producers, uh, production. Uh, you know, these uh, high value, high risk uh, uh, crop locations. 
So if someone were to try to submit a, uh, like a private garden in their backyard, for example, um, or uh, some landscaping, a fence row or something, um, they try to add that to the map, uh, that's something that I would filter out uh, that would not show up on the map. Um, both hobbyist and commercial beekeepers are okay. You don't have to be a commercial beekeeper, um, but if you're growing a specialty crop, then it needs to be a commercial operation. And that was a, a kind of a guideline that they set up just so that it stays useful. You know, again, it's not a do not spray list, so we don't need, you know, every house in Columbus, you know, mapped on, on the system. That, that doesn't make it useful for people. These are for high value uh, locations, uh, the exception being for bees, which are very susceptible to, to a lot of the pesticides out there. So uh, they don't have to be commercial. Um, there's also a, um, a half mile or half acre rather uh, size limit. I, I'm not really sure why they settled on a half acre, but it's to help um, weed out private gardens and private operations from commercial operations. Uh, so I guess the general feeling is if you're working less than half an acre, you're probably not uh, commercial or you don't have a whole lot invested in it. Uh, so that's kind of a arbitrary line in the sand that they've drawn uh, to help weed out private and, and commercial applicators or productions rather. Uh, the other point I was going to make is that for beekeepers, um, you know, we kind of limit the area that's being drawn to the, you know, the field boundaries that are being worked. Uh, for beekeepers, normally it's just a point, a dot on the map where the hives are, where their apiaries are. Um, or maybe if they want to draw an area around their property, uh, that's fine too. Some people do that. Um, but what we do not include is, you know, the entire uh, five mile foraging area of the bee, you know, that uh, if somebody tries to submit that, that, that does not go through. It's limited to either their individual property that the beekeeper owns, or it's just a dot on the map where they, where the hive boxes are. So that's kind of the scope of the project and the kinds of uh, the locations that will appear on the map. There's a lot of sensitive locations out there. Um, you know, human health, you know, so uh, um, nursing homes, playgrounds, you know, places that you would consider to be sensitive to pesticides, uh, those are not on the map. Um, threatened and endangered species, impaired waterways, that kind of stuff is not on the map. It may be added in the future if the board of directors wants to do that, but right now it's only crop locations, uh, high value crop locations that are on the map. Uh, and that includes pretty much any uh, fruit or vegetable. Anything other than a grain commodity crop is considered a specialty crop and could be mapped. Uh, so nurseries, hops I mentioned before, um, orchards, really any fruit or vegetable. Um, aquaculture is okay. There's a little bit of aquaculture in Ohio. Uh, we don't have any currently on the map, but they could show up there. Um, Really, the only exception to that no grain crop rule is for organic operations. Anything that's grown organically is considered specialty. Um, so if somebody was growing organic soybean uh, for tofu or something, then uh, that would be allowed on the map and it would show up in the map results. But for example, if uh, you know if your neighbor's growing the extend beans, and maybe I'm growing Liberty beans, my beans are susceptible to his dicamba product that he's going to use on his beans. But just because my beans are susceptible to his pesticide, doesn't make it a specialty crop, right? So that's another rule that uh, that we're filtering out. Um, for every state, and there's been a lot of discussion about whether those should be allowed on the map or not. But uh, as of now, the the decision is that if it's a conventional, non-organic grain, then it's not going to be on the map. 
if it's organic grain, organic soybean, that's fine, but everything, you know, could be sensitive to some other pesticide product. And, uh, you know, so those are not going to be on the map. You have a question, Mimi? Uh, the question was, would it make sense to have non GMO soybeans on there? Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that, that kind of ties into the, into, into the, you know, non-tolerant varieties of beans. Um, a lot of times I think just personally, if you're growing non GMO crops, I mean, if you can find non GMO seeds, a lot of them are grown organically. I think, um, but there are a lot of, um, you know, conventional, uh, you know, I guess the point that, that the reason behind their decision to, to, to do this, to not have conventional, you know, if, if you're spraying a pesticide on, on the, on the grain, then it shouldn't be included, um, comes down in part to the value of the crop. Uh, you know, soybean and, and corn are not as valuable per acre um, as some of these other fruits and vegetables. And I think that's their main concern uh, behind that decision. Um, organic operations, even if they're growing grain, um, you know, certified operations need to be pesticide free for three years to get that certification. You need to have all kinds of designs and um, inspections to verify that they are organic before they can use that label. Um, and so pesticide you know, contamination of those sites is expensive for them, even if they are growing commodity grains, um, because they could be out of business for three years if they lose that certified label. So I think that's why those are included. Um, and I, I'm sure that the non-GMO, uh, non-tolerant discussion will be going on uh, for a while, especially once we see what happens after this growing season that may change. But I think that they're gonna be a lot, uh, if they do that and do include non-tolerant you know, beans, you have to specify, okay, what is it non-tolerant to? You know, is it non-tolerant to Glyphosate, is it non-tolerant to dicamba? Uh, so you have to start specifying all those things. And I think a lot of folks, at least from what I've been hearing, are planting the tolerant beans anyway, just as a safety precaution in case their neighbors are using the new products. You know, they want to play it safe and planting, planting the beans, even if they're not going to use the new product, pesticide product. Um, so you know, that may change in the future. They may decide if there's a lot of feedback from the states, if they're getting a lot of uh, complaints and damage, uh, you know, complaints, and, and if they decide that that's the way to, to go, you know, it, it could change. It could change at any time. Um, we don't really have a say, you know, 100% uh, say in what happens here in Ohio. We're just a member of this organization now. So um, as of right now, it's not, uh, they're not included. Uh, so this is the registry that I've been talking about. It's a pretty simple interface and I'll try to do a live demo here in a second. Um, but it's uh, pretty straightforward. It uses Google uh, mapping images. So if you've used Google before, you're familiar with what this looks like. There's a search bar in the upper right. You can search for addresses, counties, cities, just like any other uh, mapping search. Uh, there's a button on the left that will use your GPS location if you're on your phone or GPS enabled tablet. Um, it will try to use your network connection if you're on a desktop or laptop. Uh, that's less accurate, but it kind of automatically navigate to your position uh, just to help searching things a little bit easier. Um, and you can filter if you're only interested in beehives, for example, you can turn everything else off and ignore all that. Um, or if you're only interested in organic or uh, transitioning organic operations, you can kind of filter some of the results. It's not too bad right now in Ohio, um, but a lot of other states who've been operating it for several years, uh, this map is completely covered in points and it's 
impossible to read at this scale. Uh, so zooming in and, and filtering based off of certain results is, is, is more useful and probably will be more useful um, as we get further along with this project. And then after you zoom in uh, to a particular area, if there's something in particular you want to look at, you can click on uh, one of those uh, pins, uh, labels, markers, and uh, it will display the contact information and some location for uh, that particular site. So you'll have probably the mailing address or some other contact information for the producer, the person responsible for it. Um, and it will also have the coordinates and these are the coordinates for the actual site. You know, the address may not be associated with the site. You can have multiple sites uh, per person. Um, so that's just a way of, uh, of figuring exactly where these are. And it also gives you the dates. So the dates when these were added. Maybe these were added after, you know, the day after you checked it. Um, it keeps track of any changes made. So you know, if somebody deletes a site or changes the shape of it, you know, kind of keeps track of that in case we need to reference that um, at some other point in the future uh, to answer questions about it. Uh, so it's it's uh, pretty straightforward. And again, I'll, I'll give you a demo here uh, in a few minutes. Um, one of the things I did want to mention uh, is that this new program um, is much more compatible with devices than the previous registry program, you know, version one uh, that we've been operating for the past few years. Um, this is, um, it's written in a little bit different way so that it's compatible on mobile devices as well as desktop, laptops, so you can use it on your phone, your tablet. Um, if you're doing that, it works on uh, all different browsers. Doesn't matter what kind of browser you're using, Windows, Android, uh, iOS devices, it's compatible with all of those. And in fact, they just had a couple uh, apps for your phone or tablet released uh, for Android and, and Apple products. Um, so you can search through the website, which I'll show you in a second, um, but there's also a standalone application that you can download and install on your phone if you're, if you're using mobile devices uh, to, to search the registry and it's a little bit of a cleaner cleaner look than using the website. Um, so just want to reiterate again that this is, you know, a tool for producers, for farmers, for applicators, for beekeepers. Uh, ODA is involved. We're kind of cleaning the data, but we're not really using it for anything. We're not really using it for enforcement or anything like that. We're not keeping track of how many acres you're growing uh, for some type of accounting, you know, audit or something. You know, there's nothing like that going on. Um, all the users, it is an online system. It's on, uh, on this website or through the app. So you do need to go to the website and log in. You need to create an account and log in in order to search, uh, the sites that are, that are on there. Um, some sites are set up a little bit differently. I think Indiana, for example, has a public map where you don't need to, to have an account. Um, but here in Ohio, we do have a little bit of a privacy setting where you need to have an account before you can search uh, the locations. Um, that being said, if somebody wants to add uh, a, a crop operation or a hive, beehive to the map and they don't have computer, they don't have internet access, uh, we do have some uh, Amish growers, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables uh, on the system, they would contact me or they can contact somebody at FieldWatch um, and I'll get that added to the system for them. So uh, producer, beekeeper side, you know, you don't have to have internet access to use this. You know, we'll get it on there for you if that's what you want. But, you know, searching and, you know, from an applicator standpoint, uh, you know, there's no paper maps uh, to look at. You'd have to, to have an online account uh, to, to go and search the map. Um, the other thing is that it's a little bit different for, for applicators. So uh, maybe the data is provided for you um, by your company. Maybe your company has an account or the co-op that you work for has an account and, you know, so they can provide the data for you. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have an account, I guess, yourself. That would be the exception if, if your business has, has an account. Um, and I can talk a little bit about more 
about those options in a minute. Um, the other big difference between this uh, version of the program and the previous version is that the locations will expire uh, from the map after a year. I think the deadline is actually December 31st. So the previous version, if you're familiar with that, uh, was kind of a perpetual uh, uh, you know, mapped location. It would not expire. There's no renewal required. If you mapped it in 2014, that site's going to stay on the map. Uh, you know, until today. Um, and that's not the case with this new program. This program, the sites will expire. They will not appear on the map um, after a year, you know, during the winter. And so when that happens, we'll send out a notification to people and they'll need to log back in and they'll need to renew. If it's the same location they want on the map again, they just click a button and it gets activated and added back to the map. Uh, if they're growing tomatoes, maybe it's a completely different field that they want mapped, so they don't want the old one on there anyway. They've got a new field that they're growing in, and so they'll need to add that. And so this is just kind of a, a tool to make sure that the information that's on the registry program that's on the map is you know current for this current growing season, uh, that we don't have old, uh, you know, out-of-date information uh, that people are basing their decisions on. Um, there are a few advanced uh, advanced features uh, for the program. So anybody can go to the website, create an account, and search locations through the website. Um, there are some advanced features for uh, if you want to download a copy of the data, for example. Um, you can do that. Uh, it can download it in a, a spreadsheet, you know, like an Excel type file or you can download it into a geospatial file, like a shape file, if you're familiar with, uh, with shape files. Uh, so then you can plug it into your own mapping system. If you have your own system, navigation system, your own equipment, you can plug that data into there and, and you know, view the system through what you already have rather than having you know, your map looking at the crop registry over here on some device in your planning. Uh, software, navigation software on this other device, you know, you can kind of combine those things. Uh, you're also able to, uh, <clears throat> apart from downloading it and kind of manually copying that data, you can live stream the data. Um, so if there's a, there are certain uh, technology partners and licensees that FieldWatch has uh, uh, agreements with, um, uh, AgriData, for example, AgSync, um, some companies where they're able to do this live data stream. So you don't need to manually, you know, copy data from our system to your system. Um, it kind of automatically shows up in, you know, the equipment that you're using uh, to, to drive your spray equipment. Uh, so you can kind of see that live data as you're, as you're doing your operation, uh, which is pretty cool for you know, a lot of people who are doing aerial applicators, for example, uh, they already have a lot of navigation equipment in their planes. Uh, uh, so kind of having that overlay of where these sensitive locations are is, is pretty beneficial to them. Um, I did want to say back on here is that we do have um, email notifications. Uh, so there's, uh, uh, if you sign up as a pesticide applicator, you can choose to be notified. You don't have to get notified. It can be kind of annoying. Uh, if you don't want notifications, but you can get notifications if a new area is added to the map or maybe to a subset of the map, uh, then you can get notified about that. So it's another way of staying you know, up to date about where these sites are. Um, the other thing I need to say is that uh, so the downloading the data, the live stream with the software providers, um, this is a different uh, level of user. So anybody can search the map through the website. Anybody can get those email alerts uh, for free. Uh, but these advanced tools, downloading the data, um, requires a membership. And I believe the company, like for example, Heritage Co-op, recently became a member of FieldWatch. So the people who work for Heritage um, have access to this uh, live streaming data. So Heritage would pay 
some annual fee uh, to FieldWatch, and then all their clients can have access to the data through you know, whatever equipment that they happen to be using, EggSync or EggLogic, whatever, whatever that they're using. And all of that is done uh, through FieldWatch. So if you have any interest or questions about these advanced, you know, streaming the data, downloading the data, tying it into your equipment, um, you'll need to direct those questions to FieldWatch. You know, we don't do anything with that at ODA. You know, we don't, we don't you know, take your membership money and, and do anything. Uh, I don't even know a whole lot of information about it. So all that has to be done through the FieldWatch sales reps. And I'll give you their contact information at the end of this, uh, just so you can see if you have questions about that. So real quick, uh, we're about at, at the end of the day here. Um, we've been operating for a month. Uh, we switched at the beginning of March. We've got almost 550 users, which is about where we were after the first year of the first version. Uh, so we have quite a few uh, users just after a few, you know, the first month uh, using this. As far as the locations that are currently, this is current as of yesterday, um, a lot of certified organic acreage. Uh, they are pretty quick to get on this when we launched the program. Again, there's a lot of tomato growers, uh, Red Gold, Herschel, uh, De Fratelli, uh, tomatoes in Northwest Ohio. Um, I think we normally grow eight or 9,000 acres of tomatoes in Ohio, so that number can go up quite a bit. Um, the timing was a little off, you know, starting this in, in March. It's kind of getting a little late for, for the growers to be messing around with this, but uh, it's, uh, it's pretty solid numbers. Uh, apiaries, we've got a little over 350 apiaries. Um, I think there's about 6,000 known apiaries in the state, uh, so that's about 5%. That number's probably going to stay pretty low. Uh, beekeepers, most of them don't like to advertise where they are. Uh, so that number may stay pretty low, but uh, grapes, there's a lot of grape operations. We've got 25, you know, locations totaling about 200 acres. Uh, they're usually pretty small, but there's a lot of them. Hops are starting to get going, so that number may, may increase as well uh, during the year. Uh, so real quick, it's pretty simple to get going. Everything's like I mentioned, is done online. So this is www.fieldwatch.com. If you want to add crop locations, you click on this guy. If you want to add bee locations, you click on bee check. And for pesticide applicators who just want to search the map, uh, you don't necessarily need to add anything, but if you just want to search it, you can click on that. You would specify Ohio. Um, or if you're operating in any other state that's a member, you can select that state, but only member states show up on this list. Pick your own username, whatever you want it to be. Pick your own email. Technically, you don't have to have an email address. You can just make something up, but you won't get any alerts if you do that. Uh, and you can make up your own password. You know, Previously, we would send you a very complicated password that you would have to fill out. Uh, so this kind of uh, bypasses that. Uh, and then so after you fill out that you create your account and then it will log you in and um, you can search the map and again I mentioned that you can do this um, you can do this through the website you can do this through the app it's available for both uh, Apple devices and Android devices uh, so you can get it at the Google Play Store I have iPhone you know iTunes Store um, to, to view the locations. So a lot of beehives I mentioned, you know, about 300, 400, uh, beehives here in Ohio. A lot of, uh, tomato growers in Northwest Ohio. Uh, so again, this will change during the year. People can log in at any time. They can edit their sites. They can create new sites. They can delete sites, uh, whenever they need to. Uh, so, you know, all this is subject to change, you know, check it as frequently as you need to. Some places won't, uh, you know, won't have too many locations in them, but Northwest Ohio is mainly where the tomatoes are grown. 
uh, you know, and that's, like I said, that's, that's, that's pretty simple to use. Uh, you can get your contact information. If you have a membership, then you can download this data and you can go to, um, canned images. You can go to uh, fieldwatch.com. They have their contact information there. Um, uh, this is their phone number uh, and their direct email. If you have tech support questions or you want information about uh, some of those advanced features, you can contact Fieldwatch and ask them about that. They have connections with all the retailers and, and ag businesses, uh, so they may already have you know memberships for a business that you work for. Um, that's my information. If you have general questions about field watch or maybe a simple problem, uh, I can help you with, but you know, technical stuff is, is really done through field watch now. Um, so, uh, I think that's, we're out of time. Uh, I'll be around if folks have questions about this. Um, other than that, um, thank you very much. We'll turn it back over to, uh, to Cindy for your closing statements. Thank you very much, Jared. We do have time for a couple questions, if anyone has any questions. Um, one of the questions we had um, from someone watching online, if you could review again um, for Amish growers, what do you suggest that they do um, to, to get signed up for this? Um, so what other states do, Indiana, for example? Um, I assume you heard the question. The question was for Amish growers. What 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 can they do? Who or anybody really who doesn't have computer or internet access? Uh, how can they add their locations to the map? And uh, certain uh, extension educators can help you with this. Uh, we have not done a lot of training with them yet, and some of them are very busy, so they may not be available. Um, but you can always contact me. Uh, we will have a paper registration form at some point, um, but you can, you know, probably can't shoot me an email if you don't have computer or internet, but you can call me here at this number or call somebody at the department and they can direct them to me and I will add those locations. We'll take your information, your contact information, your address and get those fields mapped uh, for you. Again, uh, you know, first priority is for people to do it themselves so that it stays up to date and current and it's accurate trying to map field locations based off of descriptions is kind of tricky. Uh, but if you're not able to do it yourself, then we're, I, you know, I'm certainly available to, to do that. You know, just give me a call and, and we'll get that worked out. Hey, we did have one other question. Yeah. Um, the question is um, just to review if there's any fees for folks to participate in the registry to sign up either to their specialty crops or to be a pesticide applicator checking it? Yeah, that could be a little uh, confusing. Uh, so there is uh, no membership fee for individual people. Uh, if you're a producer or a beekeeper or an applicator, there's no fee that you have to pay, right? Uh, it's, it's all free. Um, the membership fees come into account with if you want access to some of those advanced tools that I mentioned. Um, if you want to be able to download the data and use it in your own equipment, then there is a fee associated with that. I think it's like a hundred dollars a year. Um, but, uh, you know, just for regular users, if you're just looking at it through the internet, um, you know, or on, or on your phone, then there's no fee. Uh, you know, it's free to use. Uh, for, for folks. Um, and if you, if you are interested in those advanced features, then again, contact uh, FieldWatch and they can get you information about, about how to get that set up. Um, we, don't, we don't do that membership stuff uh, at the Department of Agriculture. Okay, any questions here in our audience? Okay, again, a big thank you again for Jared and Aaron. And thank you very much for talking today.